Heavenly Father, how we praise you, how we thank you for this time. We thank you even in our losses and the things that we experience as a result of sin in this world and even our own. Lord, we remember that you are our constant hope. You are a refuge. You are a tower. You are a strong tower in our strength. Please, O oh Lord, be with us in this time that our gaze might be filled and the vision of your Son, Jesus Christ, might eclipse all other things and we could keep ourselves in ready focus on your Son, Jesus Christ, and the perfect provision which he is for all needs and all the hope that this world will ever have. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I was meditating, thinking today, on, or this week rather, on what it is, what a joy it is to get to teach through the Christmas material, um, it, not at Christmas time. <laughs> because, you know, when we, when we study the stuff around Christmas time, we tend to just lump it all in with all the, you know, the, the various you know, uh, Christmas hymn sings and cookies and celebrations and Christmas parties. And, and we barely get the opportunity to really examine the text because we get into this, yeah, I know, I know, I know attitude. We hear it so frequently once a year. And by the way, I think that's a great thing. Christmas is my favorite time of year because we get to look at the miracle of the incarnation of Jesus Christ come to earth. It's a wonderful gift. It is a wonderful gift for each and every one of us. Um, but going through it now, in this time, we get to maybe challenge some of the things or expectations that we've never challenged before. And uh, one of those is in our passage today, these, these we three kings from the east. And so I want to begin by hopefully something that's familiar to you by now, but may not be. We, we see these three kings showing up on various um, like stationary around Christmas time, and this idea is really ingrained in us. We've even got one of the most lovely Christmas hymns, at least melodically, right, as we three kings of Orient are. And um, it's such a beautiful melody, and the sentiment behind it is so beautiful. This picture of people coming from afar uh, to, 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 to know Christ, to see Christ, to do him honor, gives us a wonderful example and a great amount of encouragement to do so. But we have to point out, as is our way, that even a positive non-biblical idea is still a non-biblical idea. So we want to correct what is to be corrected and hopefully preserve, as I think we will, what is, uh, what is not biblical or what is not reality because it is so important that we don't allow extra biblical ideas to muck up our clear vision of what God truly provided in Scripture, right? So it's not that the idea of these three kings be, is is terribly destructive or heretical in any way, but what it does is it, it adds extra information that distracts us from what God really wants us to know. And what God really wants us to know is what he's revealed here. So there's little defense for that there, there are three of these people. In fact, it seems that quite a large crowd indeed is more likely. Um, the, traditionally, you will hear about Melchior and Caspar and Balthazar, and, and this idea came out roughly in the Middle Ages. It's this kind of whole mythology built around where the kings from the various um, areas, from the east to the east, and that is almost certainly, in fact, we'll look at it, and certainly false. There is no defense for the idea that they were kings. There's no reason to think they were kings. The reason why the, middle, the church in the Middle Ages assigned kingship to them was based on two passages, most likely, Isaiah 60, 1 through 6, and Psalm 72, 11, which both talked about kings bowing or kneeling before the Messiah, not necessarily at his birth, but in general. And because the church, by after the time of Augustine, had such a perverse and flawed idea of what the kingdom of God is, and they thought it was some magical, mystical, spiritual kingdom, then they had to put that event sometime in the timeline of kings bowing down before him. So it was kind of to preserve their kingdom now idea that, uh, that they changed these very clearly not kings, magi, into kings. And they're most certainly were not there, as we'll see today, on the night of Jesus' birth. Now this one, all, all these ideas will give certain pass to. If you want to see a lovely movie, the nativity is beautiful and it preserves some of this mythology. Um, and it's still beautiful. 
absolutely still watch it, but watch it informed, knowing what was made up and what's actually scriptural, right? So this picture here uh, of, of them being there on G the night of Jesus' birth makes for great movies, right? The idea of here, these, this elegant procession of kings or wise men coming in from outside to the humble barn or stable or hole in the wall that, that uh, Jesus and Mary are in. It makes great television, but it really isn't what is going on at all in the biblical account. In fact, it's so clearly not. It's just like watching the Ten Commandments. You go, where did they get that from? Nowhere. They made it up because they wanted to make a good movie. They weren't making a good Bible study. And that's uh, not all bad in any, in any circumstance, every circumstance. But we want to be biblically informed. It all just makes great theater, makes for good watching, but we want to be able to cut the line between what is biblically accurate and what's not. So we're going to start off with some timeline warnings. These events are as likely as not two years after the birth of Jesus. How can we know that? Well, Herod's going to inquire of the wise men when they saw the star. So the implication is that this star was related to the time, maybe even the day, of the Lord's birth and its appearance. And then Herod goes on to slaughter everyone two years old or younger. That'll be what we study in the next week's passage. So that the implication of this is, is that when the wise men, the Magi, came through and spoke with Herod, as we'll study that this week, that they got timing information, or rather they gave him some timing information to know that you don't just kill all the newborns, but he has to go at least to two years old in order to effectively try to wipe out what he perceives as a challenge to his personal throne. Okay, so we're looking at two years later, and then we might ask, well, why did they stay in Bethlehem? I mean, they went out there for the census. What in the world would keep them there? Well, you got to remember the circumstance. One, that because this was uh, Dave, uh, Joseph's ancestral home, he likely had family there too, and it wasn't that hard to put down uh, roots. Additionally, he already had a, a movable skill set. He was a carpenter, and carpenters of that day, they didn't have supply chains and go to the lumber yard and all these other things. They went out into the wilderness, they found a piece of wood and began to work it with their hands. And in fact, for him to come down for any length of time, he probably would have brought certain of his tools, if not all of them. So very easy for them to set up shop somewhere else. And why would they do that? Well, you've got to remember, everybody in their small town thought that there had been infidelity. And when Joseph agreed by God's um, urging to take, and command in fact, to take Mary as his bride, they would have been viewed as unclean. They would have taken that as an admission that either he was the one who did it, oh, but Mary had been out of town when she got pregnant. So that he was essentially uh, taking on that public shame. You could see why they might want to move to the next town over and stick around. And not only that, Think about the child. To grow up as a bastard child in a small village in Israel in the first century would have been a horrifying reality. We think of kids and what they'll make fun of now, but in a, in a society where there was no one speaking largely out against condemning wrongdoing or against uh, victimizing a child for the choices of their parents, they knew that their kid, Jesus, and any other children after them were not gonna get a great shake out of uh, life socially by being uh, Im implicated in that public reputation. So it makes sense that they would stick around in Bethlehem for two years. It shouldn't be surprising to us at all. Again, it doesn't usually fit, make its way into the movies, but it does into the text. Finally, at this point, the Holy Family would have found a permanent residence. They would have been settled and established. They'd be set to go. We're going to see that when they, um, these three wise men come, they visit him in a house. So we're not thinking about them living forever in this cave. They spent that night in the, um, the Cataluma or the, the barn, we might say. Um, but after that, they did not continue to live in a barn. They found residents, just like you or I or anyone else would. And especially after the uh, census was finished and people started to clear out again, space would have become very available. And again, with family in town, they probably found someone they could rent from or a place that they could stay. So we got some background, hopefully, building us up into this. And now we're going to look to Jesus being born in Bethlehem. It says, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men came from the east. Uh, from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born, king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. So, we want to look here 
first of all, at this simple statement, in the city of Bethlehem, in the region of Judah. Now, uh, Bethlehem is right here. You can see it's just a stone's throw from uh, Jerusalem. So it's nearby, not quite a stone's throw, a, a near walk. And this city is real. It's actual. We have dug up remains from it. And we can, you can go to the Holy Land now, as, as many of you have, and tour this area, tour the area of Bethlehem. You can look at various sites proposed for the birth of Jesus and other events that are important. And we know that this region of Judea was, it was in fact, the region, the political region that was called Judea because of its relationship to the tribe of Judah. And once they returned from uh, the Babylonian captivity, largely the tribe of Judah was in charge. And so that's when we start to see people not just calling them Israel, but rather calling them the Jews, right? So this, this idea of the Jews becoming a larger scope picture for the people of Israel or the, the nation of Israel uh, is pointed out. And what I want to point to here again is that never once in the biblical text is there a sense that they're mythologizing, that they're just recording a sense of mythology or anything. Real people, real places, real cities that we have confirmed throughout history. And it's interesting to see that people and skeptics and critics of the Bible will look at any lack of say, archaeological information, and say, because we don't see this, that proves the Bible false. But an absence of evidence is no evidence at all. It's just an absence of evidence. It means we haven't found evidence yet. It doesn't mean that no evidence is there. But to the contrary, you have to remember that time and time and time again, when the Bible talks about places, personalities, and regions, political regions and otherwise, that we see them confirmed again and again and again. So we have to rec we want to take just a moment and remember Okay, And remember that any time someone's talking about the lack of evidence for biblical narratives, you have to count up the thousands and thousands of thousands of times when a real city or a real ruler or a real region is mentioned, and that's exactly what is historically concerned, confirmed. Right? So it's not all the fantastic confirmations of Scripture, like we found you know, a seal or a signet with David's or uh, Baruch's name, the scribe of Jeremiah, which are all true. We find those. Those are powerful testaments to the reality of the text. But also, every time the text uses real names and real places, it's reminding us of the reality. And this is important because your faith as a Christian is not just rooted in a couple of empty or even nice philosophies. It's not just a do better and what a nice example that is. It is rooted in reality. Jesus Christ came to earth in, in the flesh. And because he came to earth in reality, in our history, we have a staked point of focus to know that God's plan is working, that he is working through history. So Matthew believed he was writing history here. And we notice all uh, again also in the days of King Herod. Again, this is another person for whom we have ample and extreme amounts of historical recognition of. Josephus writes about him and, and many others. He's important to Roman history in general. He's important to world history. And he is, uh, had a, a known reign. So let's look at King Herod because he is the looming figure over this. And we might have mixed ideas. So... Depending on which site, and again, historical, historically assigning dates can be difficult. Uh, we, we see him reigning between 37 BC and 4 BC. Some people will date his reign and his death as late as 1 AD. So on the early, early of the, what we now call the divide between being before Christ and Anno Domini, which means the year of our Lord. So <clears throat> he had a, a, a decently long reign. He was born in Idumea. And he's an Edomite, and his father was an Edomite, and their family had converted under the conquest of John Hyrcanus, who forced conversion. So what we see is when we celebrate Hanukkah and the Maccabees, who came over and basically took over and kicked Greek, Greece and Greek rulership out, and they experienced this period of self-governance, a little bit more autonomy, just a very short blip in their history after a fashion, but they experienced that time period, and in that time period, they continued to push out, and as they moved across these Edomite lands, they would, instead of uh, you know, killing them, they offered the opportunity for them to convert by the sword, 
right? And so lots, what happens when you convert by this rule? Well, a lot of people convert. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> That's actually not God's way, but it's kind of effective. And so it's effective after a fashion, but what we see in the, in the life of Herod is that his father, Antipater, was connected, uh, liked, and really well-liked by Julius Caesar. So what we see is he get a family that converts because they had to. They continue to be, and they grow in power both from the Jewish perspective and from the Roman perspective. And what we see is that because it's a conversion by the sword, his faith never really was anything but a political affair. Right? So <clears throat> though deft, through deft political maneuvering, he became Rome's puppet king over Israel. Right? So he becomes Rome's puppet king, and he takes that title uh, very offensively to the Jewish people or the Jewish believers of king of the Jews or the king of Israel. Now, they knew that that title was reserved for the messianic king in the line of David alone, and Herod could barely be called or call himself a Jew by any uh, biological markers. He also lived a decadent life and built amazing things, all on the taxes and the backs of the people, the very poor people whom he ruled. But he was a great builder. He was responsible for putting together one of, uh, making the temple of Israel one of the wonders of the ancient world, the very thing that we'll look at very frequently. So he's the one who starts that major renovation, probably to gain both fame and curry favor with the faithful Jews. But above all, he feared being supplanted. He valued above all things his own power, his own authority, and his own reign to the point where he killed many of his own sons. And Julius Caesar, who fancied him, at least from a political uh, perspective, a friend, said he would rather be Herod's pig, and that's Hoiros, than his son, Huios. So it sounds, uh, it sounds, it's more witty <laughs> in Greek, if you like. But the point was that even his political allies said, and you are better off being Herod's pig because he's pretending to be a Jew than his son, who might have a, put some sort of threat towards him. We want to get the picture of this fellow, and it's really, again, another fascinating thing as you read through secular history. We re read about a man who is certainly uh, decadent, self-absorbed, and absorbed in his own power, and then they'll question the clear uh, record of Scripture and saying, but I don't know if he'd kill a bunch of people. Like, I don't know if he'd kill babies. Like, of course he would. He was a monster, in a living in a monstrous time. He would do that without any expectation. So again, we want to see that the attacks upon Scripture are always so vain, so ridiculous. Well, we don't know that he actually killed all those babies. I mean, sure, it was absolutely within his character, and it's nothing that he would record himself doing, and so he would forbid it from being written down except by those who were affected by it, and it really would be a small group of people uh, numerically who were affected, who had no recourse at all. So it's uh, another point that when you hear the History Channel just kind of offhandedly say, we don't think, or Herod likely never did, or anything like that, just recognize they're full of it. To be very frank, they're just dealing from their secular presuppositions, and they're going to speak with all authority, but they've not done any real honest intellectual research towards coming to a, a conclu that conclusion. It's all their bias and presupposition. So what we see in Herod the Great and how he approaches, he is from a Jewish perspective uh, universally, and also how he portrays himself, is portrayed in scripture, shows him to be quite the monster indeed, and uh, the consummate politician. And from there we see our, so again, imagine yourself as a Jewish person living under the reign of Herod, not being comfortable with him, not uh, being comfortable with him in terms of his religion, his politics, in terms of his decadent and ungodly lifestyle, not really liking him, but also being terrified about him because you know he's willing to kill even his family to preserve his power. So what would he do to you if you put your head up too high? In fact, it might be enough to hide your uh, relationship to the Davidic line altogether, right? Just because you didn't want to appear to be a threat to someone who is so insane in his own rulership. Things are wrong in the nation of Israel at this time. And the Jews are deeply aware of it. And now we see these kings or wise men or magi 
We've got all sorts of different ways in which this has been translated over the years. But we're going to call them the Magi in the context of this because that is what they are in the Greek. And I've, ta I've talked to you before. I'm not a huge fan of transliterating words that we don't have a direct uh, one across to. That is just using the Greek name and bringing it across. But in this case, I couldn't find a better option. Wise men would be fine, but it doesn't quite give the picture because a wise man could be anyone. These were officials. These were someone specific. So that's why we're going to call them the wise men. So first of all, in order to understand the Magi and how they came to be here, you have to understand the Babylonian captivity. Now, the Babylonian captivity was the time after the kingdom had divided, right? So we're talking after David, after Solomon, after the division into the northern kingdom of the, of the ten tribes mostly, and the two tribes... Uh, constituted the kingdom of Judah, the southern kingdom, and the, the reality of that as both kingdoms struggled to try to follow God, or rather we would say God struggled to keep them uh, in line and walking with him, ultimately ending in the northern kingdom in 722 BC, being taken off and deported by Assyria, and the southern kingdom is then judged by being carted off to Babylon, right? These are your... Uh, these are your, the book of Daniel records this and um, goes on to Isaiah, Ezekiel, and others uh, describe this time, as well as Second uh, Chronicles, of course. So the Jewish people we find in the Babylonian captivity and in the succeeding nations had big jobs. Daniel was a high-ranking advisor, if not the top-ranking advisor, to at least three kings, probably more, certainly more. Um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had important places in the official world. Nehemiah was a cupbearer to the king. It's a very high-ranking. It's not just someone who holds the cup, but it's someone who has, a, has the ear of the king after a fashion. Mordecai and Esther, we both saw, were high-ranking and very successful in the Persian government in the world. So what's the point? There were a lot of Jewish people who retained their Jewish identity but lived and continued on as the nations rolled through. They didn't return when Cyrus, uh, at Cyrus's edict and, and telling them that they could. They stayed where they were because they were comfortable. They were uh, very powerful or they'd come to positions of great um, prestige and import. So of course they wouldn't leave that. Babylon, Babylon, we find, as a Jewish community, was second only to Jerusalem. In fact, that's why we think it makes a great deal of sense that Peter spent a good portion of his ministry after the Christian diaspora in Babylon, because that would have been where the Jews uh, continued to hang out, spend time. And in fact, what we find historically is after Jerusalem fell in 70 AD and then the uh, judgment after the Bar Kokhba revolt, Babylon becomes the center of Judaism. This is, of course, after the time of the Bible but becomes the center of Judaism, Jewish life, faith, and culture. And to this day, one of the most important documents is un in understanding Judaism as it exists now is the Babylonian Talmud. Talmud. The Babylonian collection of scriptures and com what we'd call commentaries is one of the most important documents in understanding where Judaism is at theologically and in, in, uh, today. So, the point that I want to draw, is that there were lots of Jewish people who maintained and continued in important positions, but also maintained their, uh, their Jewishness both ethnically and in terms of their faith. So then we have to ask, if we have these Jewish people who are high up and high ranking in every uh, administration going forward, and keep in mind, right, we might think of a, a tyrant coming through and taking out the old king, and then we might think of him like offing everybody who was important, offing everybody who had any authority. But that's not what you would do because, you know, you're smarter than that. You'd let, you, you just wanted to be in charge, right? So anybody who knew how things worked, everybody was wise, you go, yep, we'll take you, we'll take you, we'll take you. You might take care of a couple if you found them threatening. But for the most part, as you'd move from, say, the Medo-Persian Empire into the Greek Empire, they would largely keep those people in their places of authority uh, and, and so that they would continue to be important throughout that. So we have to ask, what did the Jews bring? And even if these are three entirely Gentile, uh, or if these are, sorry, this group of people is entirely Gentile in makeup, they would have had access by Daniel and by these other people to Jewish scriptures. So what might they have known? Well, Numbers 24, 17 says, this is the pro prophecy of Balaam. He says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. 
A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel. A batter and batter the brow of Moab and destroy all the sons of tumult. So we see that this connection between a star and the Messiah would have first jumped into their mind and it was very early, in fact, right in the Pentateuch itself, placed in their mind and in their expectation. Isaiah 60, 1 through 3, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and the deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings in brightness of your rising. So this idea of a rising star, we saw that this is what mistook uh, or confused the early church, or the Middle Ages church, into trying to make these three wise men kings. But, see the point of the world, of the connection, the relationship between a star, between a physical light in the physical world, to point them that way. They would have had Daniel chapter 2. Daniel received these prophecies and wrote most of this in uh, Babylon itself. And so they would have preserved those documents, certainly, in the uh, archives of the various kind of libraries of the well-known and the wise. Daniel 2 says, You, O king, he's speaking to Nebuchadnezzar and explaining his dream, were watching, and behold, a great image. This great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, and feet partly of iron and partly of clay. So this passage and the whole of Daniel 2, i give you an opportunity to read that on your own, gives us this picture. This chart's taken from um, LaHaye and Isis' chart book. Uh, but... We see is that they had been the recipients of the initial promise of what nation, the prophecy of what nations would come. And what would they expect? They would expect that head of gold, Babylon, to be behind them. It was. Then the Medo-Persian Empire, fitting all of the characteristics of this silver arm and chest piece, right? The Medo-Persian Empire taking two parts, having a stronger dominant arm, the Persian Empire, and the weaker arm, the uh, Median Empire. And then followed by Greece, and this uh, stronger, more powerful, and yet also uh, less valuable empire of, of the Greek empire. And now here we are in Rome, and now they know to expect something. See, this ancient document that even if they weren't Jewish, they would take very seriously because it had been accurate to this point. So they were ready. Their minds were looking. Not only that, Daniel 7 also, rec also records the same vision from the Jewish perspective. And each of these, instead of being precious metals from the Gentile perspective, this beautiful kingdom and, and you know, height of man's power and glory, it's, they're seen as these savage animals that have come to tear and bite and rule over in a, in a despotic way the Jewish nation and particularly Jerusalem. So you have the Babylonian Empire, this uh, pictured as a winged lion, in some ways most noble and most typical of what is yet to come in man's self-worshipping uh, empire. The Medo-Persian Empire here, a lumbering bear with three, um, three ribs in his mouth, and the ram and he-goat uh, giving us more information in Daniel 8. Uh, the leopard, the picture of this four-headed leopard with great wings speedily moving, giving a perfect picture of Alexander the Great as he swept over the world, the known world, and conquered everything in his path. And finally, this horrifying consummate beast of Rome. Again, they'd seen it. They'd seen it. They'd seen it. They'd seen it pay out. So, of course, they're going to show up. Not only that, Dan Daniel 9 gave them even more information. They could go back to the command to return to Israel, or Cyrus's command, and count out the 70, and you have it here translated as weeks, because uh, the Hebrew word Shavuot is often used to translate a week, but it's really the word seven. So 70 sets of seven years. And so they could do the math. They were smart. They were able to do the math and say, look, we're right around the right time. We're not, not going to read and exegete this prophecy for you. We're going to point out that they had it, and they had every reason to trust in it. The reason why we want to point this out is the next point. They did know the stars, but we oftentimes miss 
characterize these people just as some sort of pagan astrologers. And it's odd to me, or it would seem very odd, that God, who absolutely denied the pagan practices of astrology in every way and demonized them in every way, did so rightly, looking to the creation to see what will determine the future being wrong. And so it seems odd that these magi would be drawn by pagan thinking and pagan practices but if we look at what they definitely had scripturally, we can see why they would have come. We can see what would have brought them here. So now we need to talk about the star. All right, The star is, the star is tough because we've, we've got lack of information again. There's a couple great theories, and um, I've got my favorite, but I really don't think that either one is uh, incredibly anti-biblical or in any way anti-biblical um, or, or ridiculous in any way. So one way of thinking is a special conjunction planned before the dawn of time that we see the stars moving together and some sort of unique conjunction going on that uh, signified to these men that, that this, the time had come and the Messiah was here. Now the cool, there's actually a lot of great research. We've got a documentary called The Star in the Back that you really enjoy looking at it. Just really cool from a purely scientific standpoint what we can do by uh, casting. Now the challenge of this is that the star appears to do things that that conjunction doesn't do. So those are the, the challenges. But I'd encourage you to look up and do some research on that if you so desire. Another possibility that this is a miraculous event to mark the Messiah's birth. That is to say that it is not something that we can look at our existing world and find out what happened naturalistically, but rather that it was something that God did with the Shekinah glory miraculously. This fits a little bit more of the evidence that we're going to see in terms of the, how this uh, star behaves so unnaturally, but it's uh, Another, and finally, and I think equally as likely, is an elect angel sent by the Lord. So we have very early on in Scripture the relationship between stars and angels. Uh, and uh, how that relationship works and what that means to us is not as clearly defined as we'd like. But it wouldn't seem in any way impossible that the Lord is using an actual angelic being to fulfill this function in the ancient text. So three perfectly good theological uh, things for you to fight about while we're having coffee afterwards. So they come and they show up, right? They've been on a long, long, dangerous even journey and they ask ob the obvious thing. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Right? So they come before the king as would be an appropriate thing to do is your big news, you're probably a big group of people. Uh, and these were often used these people were often used to recognize kings in the ancient world anyway. So it's uh, it's it's a shocking event. It'd be big a big deal as they came into Jerusalem. The Magi, of course, would have had an expectation, right? You've got the same books we've got, and you actually live here. You guys believe this stuff, don't you? Don't you? Where is he? Where's the guy? Everyone's got to be waiting with bated breath for this guy. And everyone kind of quietly looks down and goes, oh, we don't talk about that with Herod around. Right? Everyone just kind of embarrassingly looks down and goes, oh, yeah, well, it'd be dangerous to talk about the truth of the word of God these days. So we don't really do it. They were robbed of their messianic anticipation, the true hope, because they were buffaloed by a tyrant false king. They expected and undoubtedly expected this to be the front page news everywhere they went and to find out that they were almost, at least apparently, catching the Jewish nation, the Jewish world by surprise would have been a shock to them of the highest order. They note here that he's born the king of the Jews. Now, this is a special note about what they expected regarding this messianic king, that he wouldn't be coronated king at some point, but he was born qualified and set for that office, right? You didn't just make a kid the king because he was born to the, uh, born to the previous king, right? You had to wait and see if he was going to live that long, if he was going to have some other problem along the way. You don't you don't call them the king until they're the king. Before that, they're the prince, right? That's why we have that word. But this one's special. This one is born for his office. They saw his star. 
They personally note that this is not one of the stars we've seen before. This is his special star. It belongs to him. It is related to him, this coming king. We saw it. How did you guys not see it? And they want to worship him. Now, this isn't that uh, we don't talk about like, oh, I'm going to go to the president, president and I'm going to worship him. We might talk about doing him honor. Uh, that was a, a fuzzier line back then. Doing Worshiping a king wouldn't be that shocking or outlandish to, to impart worth to them, to speak of their worth or to speak well of them, to talk about how great they are would have been an acceptable thing and, and noted as worship. But it does give us this impression that they knew that this coming Messiah was a bit more than what the world might have expected. So then we find out that the king, or when King Herod heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Can you believe it? You've got this tyrannical psychopath in charge of great military power, financial power, and the ability to call Rome in if he really needs the help. You can bet if that king is upset or, or worried about who is, uh, who is trying to supplant him or take over his throne, that he's willing to kill anybody and everyone who even looks like a threat. No due process, no double checking, just be on the safe side and kill freely. Would have been this murderous lunatic's M.O. So, of course, all Jerusalem is panicked and trying to find a way to either hide the reality or hide from the reality so that Herod will not launch into some terrible murderous rampage. What troubles Herod troubles everyone. And then he goes off and does his uh, research. He gathers together the chief priests and the scribes. He wants to find out where this uh, child has been born who is going to be born. And this is exactly what the Lord said. Micah 5.2 has is, is been uh, using the Greek text translated to us here as, reserve, uh, as preserved in Matthew. It says, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. So here we have our prophecy and fulfillment again. We talked about how there are different ways in which the Old Testament, and particularly prophecy, is used. This is our favorite category again. A prophecy, the straight-up literal fulfillment. God said, the, the Messiah, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. And Beth, specifically, this Bethlehem, Bethlehem uh, this specific one, because there were two cities called Bethlehem, specifically this one, you can know exactly where he's going to be born, where he's going to come from in terms of the, the place of his physical birth. This is our favorite kind because it's the way we usually think of prophecy. But I do want to remind us that that's not the only way in which the word fulfillment will be used in the book of Matthew or in the New Testament in general. And so we'll also see a passage or prophecy with a point of similarity. In other words, kind of saying this has the fingerprints of God on it. It's like what God does. And we'll look at that, a prophecy like that next time. Or a general principle that is proved true. In other words, we'll see how, uh, how the, in certain times just the general principles of Scripture are proved true and demonstrated in the life of Messiah. And what is that of Jesus? And what is that? That is God, or that is Brother Matthew saying, see, this is just like what God did, does or did and always does. An Old Testament theme or pattern repeated. Um, so, again, we need to break from our, our, our exclusive idea that the only way in which prophecies are fulfilled is in this, yep, he said Bethlehem, and it's Bethlehem. We have that kind of fulfillment, and it is ample uh, encouragement for us to understand. But just like we saw, talked about in our previous study with the, uh, the mystery of mom's cookies, you're looking for a lot of elements to recognize. Are they really mom's cookies, right? The fact that she said she was going to bake cookies is, is good enough reason. But if they're Oreos, you know that's not mom's cookies because mom doesn't make Oreos. No one with a soul makes Oreos. i got to stop being so hard on the Oreos. I know that some of you people like Oreos. Isn't that chocolate? It's dusty stuff. so gross. Anyway, um, if you could just get Oreo cream filling, I would eat that. That's more gross, sorry. 
But the point is, is this is what Matthew and the other New Testament authors are saying. They're not just saying that Jesus fulfills the specific prophecies that would literally be fulfilled, but he, ex- he fulfills everything about God's creation and expectation and what we're meant to expect of God. So we'll get to see greater examples of that actually just next week. So if you need to hold your breath till then, go ahead and do that. Um, don't really. That would be bad for health. A secret meeting. So now he calls them into this secret meeting, and we see here Herod's hollow faith. He said to them, uh, sorry, then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. Um, I... I, again, I can't speak highly enough of the wonderful movie, The Nativity. It's just a beautiful, uh, heartfelt, faithful uh, portrayal of these events. But it is, this scene is particularly powerful because you see that Herod, in, this, in the scene of the movie, gathers his family around him and tries to make the most pastoral, gentle, loving, hopeful, faithful, believing image of himself and project that to these, uh, these wise men, to these magi, so that he can get their cooperation but Herod's a politician. He pretends to be Jewish when it's important to maintaining the favor or obedience of his people. He pretends to be Roman and faithful to Rome when it's important to maintaining power with those above and around. He pretends to be a believer when it fits and he, he encourages them to find the child. Why? Oh, so I too may worship him. I believe exactly what you believe when it's quite convenient and expedient politically. But we can't forget what Herod did to his own children and know his desire. What do I want to point out is that there will always be politicians. I don't mean the career of politician. I mean people who, for the reasons of political expedience, for their desire for power, will tell you anything. And might I exhort you Rather than trusting in the words of any given politician, no matter what they have to say, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't trust that their ends are going to align ultimately with the Lord. Our hope is in Christ and is in Christ alone. And so we see here that one of the major themes in the book of Matthew is that everybody is going to want to turn on and destroy the Christ because it means losing power for me. If I can manipulate him, if I can use him to get more power, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees tried to do, then I'll be for him. But if it means handing over my authority and handing over my power, we're not interested in that. He couldn't be the Messiah. He couldn't be. Let's try to kill him. That same desire will cause us to pull back from Christ. When we want to make, call the shots in our lives, then we will be threatened by Jesus Christ, the righteous one, will be threatened by the word of God and will pull back. So here, Herod's hollow faith is uh, very clear to us as we read. And then we see the star moves on. This is, a, this is an important moment in the drama of what's going on in this text. It says, and they heard the king, they departed, and behold, this word idu is a, is a, is a, is a word of great importance. It's not, la- it's not re- uh, unreadily used in Scripture. It is a distinct marker. Anytime you see the word behold in Scripture, stop, put down your Bible and say, all right, I'm going to see something important here. I'm ready. I'm not just reading, you know, to read and not, not letting the words pour over me. He said, behold. He said, stop. Take a, take a picture. Figure this out. This is important. And what is important? The star which they had seen in the east, went before them till it came and stood over where the child was. Graphically, I can't tell you what this looked like. There's questions. Did it continue in the heaven of heavens? Did it come down and angelically represent itself closer to them? We can't say, but what we can say with absolute certainty is they were in no doubt that the star was doing something supernatural, unexpected, moving, and it settled and pointed them not just to a city, but to a specific home. It brought them directly to the very Messiah, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. A moving star would be shocking at any point, 
What is Matthew saying? He's saying that these people who came from the east, likely of Jewish descent, if not uh, just of Jewish influence, came down and were guided by the very hand of God to bring them to the exact spot wherein the Messiah was living. They responded in three important ways. This is when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child, Mary and his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So we see this picture of them rejoicing, giving gifts, and worshiping. You can see why they would experience such incredible joy. They had just arrived at Herod, the person called King of the Jews. They'd arrived in the land from whence all these prophecies had originated, about which and where they were meant to be fulfilled, and nobody seemed to care. Everyone was scared to talk about it, and the only thing they had was a questionable and deceptive king who was clearly manipulating them for his own ends. They were undoubtedly discouraged in their quest, in their pursuit of the Lord. And now when they see moving star it's a reminder that it was god himself who had sent them on it who was revealing himself in this time it was a reminder that all of the vain hopes aspirations and deceptions of mankind could never undo what god had done they rejoiced they saw what the god of israel had predicted Can you imagine you found an old book and you're clearly looking through the weathered pages and the cracked old binding, you know it's been around forever, and you open it up somewhere towards the middle and it has a listing of first will be President George W. Bush, then Barack Obama, then Donald J. Trump, then Joseph Biden. Would you close the book at that point? And you go, wait a minute, this was clearly written in the 20s and it's got all these, who's next? But I'd be wondering, right? Would you look at that? Well, that's exactly what had happened to these guys. They had seen the the history written in advance through prophecy. And it caused them to find hope in this Messiah. They'd seen Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Alexander the Great, Rome. They'd seen all of this displayed throughout the books of Daniel and Zechariah and others. They knew that this king was going to change everything. And so they were excited to see Jesus Christ. They weren't going to miss it. They were going to embark upon a dangerous, long, arduous, seven, you know, sorry, several month journey, if not years journey, to see him. And so when they saw him, they rejoiced. They chose to rejoice in him. They chose to worship him, to, to, to declare what he meant for humanity and what it was yet to do, all the hope that was bound up in this young child born, possibly two years old, waddling on the ground, having his diapers changed by his parents and babbling out the early words of any two-year-old. And they worshiped him. And then they gave him gifts, gold symbolizing his reign, his kingship, frankincense symbolizing his priesthood, his active role as the uh, high priest, and finally myrrh. Now we see prophetically symbolizing his death for sin and his payment for our failures. Then we find they are warned in a dream. It says them being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod. They departed for their own country another way. So they were warned in this dream. And we want to note here, God again intervenes via revelation. He doesn't fiddle with people's will. He just says, by the way, this is what's going to happen. They could have chosen to ignore Revelation. They could have chosen to go with it. These were wise men. So they went ahead and did what God had to say. But the reality is is that we see constantly throughout this that God doesn't seem to interfere with people's will ever. He just seems to appeal to them through his own revelation. So there's another picture of that. Um, He's not controlling these things, though he does have the final sovereign say. He has everything in control. But he always operates by making an appeal to the individual will through his revelation. What does it mean? This is another major point in Matthew's case. This is what Matthew is trying to point out. That same thing, revelation to change your mind about who Jesus Christ is. Particularly that this Jesus was absolutely 
uh, marked by God in every way. God guided wise men from foreign lands just to see and certify this miracle. Jesus is the promised Messiah and everything proves it. And the question that I would have to you and for me, if we were looking for one single application point in all this, it would be that if these, these wise men, however many of them there were, were willing to, to hike miles and months just to see Jesus, do you have an equal level of excitement every time you open your Bible? Are you as excited to see him as he's portrayed clearly through his word? Are you so excited to have the opportunity to worship him with his people? Are you excited to give and to serve him as they were? If you're not, it's only because we have a deficient view of his greatness and his glory and his place as the only hope of humanity. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, how we thank you and praise you for your wonderful and perfect provision for us in Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Please, O oh Lord, be glorified in our hearts and our actions and our minds as we behold your Son. Give us courage, as you gave Matthew, to make him known throughout this world. Father, for one day soon, the entire world will see him. One day, not far from this, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. One day, not far from this, Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, will take his place upon the throne of David, and we will see the effects of sin largely removed from this world. All of our hope rests on Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen.